AI audio generator Udio now generates, I kid you not, complete stand-up comedy, jokes, punchlines, and even the crowd laughing. AI and robotics now pick up things with tentacles in the craziest, creepiest, weirdest, softest, strangest, eeriest way I have ever seen. The Pew Research Center has some fascinating new stats on ChatGPT. A bunch of drones have been attached to a fire hose, which seems weird, but is actually genius when you see it. The FDA has now authorized AI software to diagnose sepsis. Archetype AI has now built this super duper multimodal model. We're talking accelerometers, gyroscopes, radars, cameras, microphones, and even thermometers. Experts have weighed in on what life realistically might look like in the year 2024. And guess what? I did a podcast with one of my favorite AI YouTubers, David Shapiro. But first, let's check our countdown to AGI. Hope we're still at 72% and we are. There you go. But we are at 72.3 because this new paper was added. So I'll get into this paper later in the video during the research section, so stay tuned. But first, let's take a trip to the local stand-up comedy club and listen to the newest in AI-generated stand-up comedy, the text-to-audio generation platform Udio, which is really looking pretty good. It's starting to maybe be the best one out there, and everybody's been talking about it this week, is doing something that they're not even advertising that much on the front page that is blowing my mind. And that is not just creating music. It is not creating music with lyrics. And that is actually creating stand-up comedy. And I'm talking about the huge human voice with all of the tonations, the actual punchlines that make sense, and the crowd laughing. The entire vibe is just like a stand-up comedy set, and I can't believe it. I was thinking about the animal kingdom <laughs> and their secret lives. <laughs> like, what if squirrels had a nut-based economy? They'd be hoarding acorns like Wall Street bankers, trading them on the Squirrel Stock Exchange. <laughs> okay, so if you analyze that, of course, there's a few things where the timing of when the audience laughs probably wouldn't make sense because the content wasn't right. Like, so... I think there would be a couple laughs if he was really in the groove. And I was thinking about the animal kingdom and their secret lives, like... Ha ha ha, you know, people are ready for the laugh. Like some of that felt pretty realistic. What if squirrels had a nut-based economy? And then you hear that laugh. <laughs> That's not quite the punch that people would have laughed at. It didn't get that part right. I think they would have still thought that was the setup and it kind of feels like he came down with a hammer on something. So it's wrong, but you still feel like it's got all of the elements of a real stand-up comedian. Like, what if squirrels had a nut-based economy? What if squirrels had a nut-based economy? Okay, that's not the joke, but now you're, you know, you're putting your mindset into where the joke should be. They'd be hoarding acorns like Wall Street bankers, trading them on the squirrel stock exchange. <laughs> They'd be hoarding those acorns like Wall Street bankers. Okay, the bankers do hoard money. They'd be trading them on the Squirrel Stock Exchange, which is true, but that's not, you know, that's not quite the punchline. But then they erupt like it was, and I just, I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's not the greatest punchline, but then they'd be trading them on the Squirrel Stock Exchange. Ha, ha, ha. Now, I'm not privy to what's happening in the background, why the lyrics don't just sound like mumbles like some of the other ones do, but it actually makes jokes. It must be some kind of weird thing where they maybe have something like ChatGPT generating lyrics when a song is requested with lyrics or somehow the model is not just making the sound of music or I just don't think it would be so coherent but listen to this so <laughs> the singularity when AI becomes smarter than humans imagine a world where you have sex robots you thought your girlfriend was high maintenance, tried debugging your robo pussy when it keeps blue screening mid <laughs> again. Yeah. Wouldn't that be hilarious? There's something about that comedian's voice that sounds like he could be a real comedian, like he's worked on that tonation and all that stuff. And I just like, I couldn't believe how good the stand-up comedy is coming out of this. And wow, we might just really have AI generated 
comedy specials soon. And I feel bad. Like, com- I really respect comedians. It is so hard to get up there and get that kind of comedic timing down. And although a real human would absolutely have got those punchlines to make more sense, it's hard at, at a local comedy act to have such a feeling of like large audience and such good timing. And it really nailed down some of that. You can tell it was trained on real like comedy specials, like real big Netflix stuff. Yeah, and, and if you want to see Udo in more depth, especially when it comes to like the music and vocal generation, Matt Provid did a great video, AI Explained did a good video, so there's already some stuff out there you should check out. I just didn't see them talking about the comedy side of it, and I was like, that was the most impressive part in my opinion. So these roboticists were supposedly inspired by these crazy squid-like jellyfish type form factors, and they came up with something that I just, can't get over for some reason. It's this thing, it just puts air into these little tube things to make them straight and then sucks the air out and they all curl up. But because it can curl up in so many ways, it can grab the craziest objects and just lift them up and move them. I mean, I don't know, a form factor like that could be like hanging on the bottom of a drone, it could pick up like a puppy or something and move them to the other side of the yard. Like, I, I don't know, that's just a weird form factor. So yeah, this is a collection of thin tentacles that are meant to engage and ensnare tiny little objects or just objects depending on how big those those tentacles are. Similar to how a jellyfish collects stunned prey, that was the inspiration. I don't want to be prey to that thing in the future. I don't want that thing hanging off a drone. I don't want an industrial size one of those that could pick me up. Nope, nope, nope. But that collection of filaments certainly does work. And you can see the examples there. It can grasp and secure, hold heavy and odd shaped objects. And then the gripper relies on a simple inflation or deflation to wrap around the object and just suck it up. So I think those things are just naturally super curled. And then you can push air into them. They get straight. So then you can reach around the object and then they all just like, you know, just however, like chaotically, they just wrap around it and lift it up. It's like, poof. But then I was thinking like maybe in the future, AI could actually control each of those individually, make some assumptions on the shape of the object. And we might have like such a weird like form factor for just pick, imagine a robot in your house. It's just like, instead of using hands, it's just like bloop, bloop, and moves a, you know, apple over here and cuts it and then prepares your lunch or something. So if you're in the AI space, you probably know Matt Provid, you probably know Matt Wolf, and you probably know David Shapiro. One of my top three favorite creators. I've listened to many, many hours of his content. I've always found it super interesting. And yeah, I actually got a chance to hang out with him for a little over an hour and film a podcast. So yeah, the podcast won't be on his main page, but if you are joined in his Patreon group, which I, I mean, I am, I pay for it. I love it. Uh, he's actually one of my only two Patreons. If you feel like joining another Patreon group, I have one too. And yours truly, hanging out with David Shapiro. We talked about some really fun stuff. Jobs, P. Doom, if we have free will, all sorts of cool stuff. All right, let's throw some stats into the news today. And we can do that thanks to the Pew Research Center, which has been tracking chat GPT information. All right, so TLDR is chat GPT is getting more popular, mostly among younger adults. So it's the 18 to 30 group. 43% of these adults have used chat GPT. At 33%, they were already at the top and they've gone up another 10%. It is interesting that how much education you have tends to correlate with the percentage of your demographic. So if you only went to high school and have a diploma, it's 12%. Whereas if you move your way up the kind of education ladder, you end up at 37% of those with a postgraduate or other advanced degree using it. I was trying to think about what that might mean. Like maybe just people who only have a high school education don't do the same kind of jobs where actually ChatGPT can like help them because maybe they don't need to write, I don't know, like fancy emails to their like corporate overlords because they, they just work something that's like a more manual labor job or something. But if you want to break down why they're using it for entertainment value seems to be about 17% to learn something new is about 17%. And then for tasks at work, you get a little bit more up to 20%. It's interesting that tasks at work is going up too, because remember people were so guarded about putting their data into a system like this because they were kind of handing it over especially their secret sauce or any of the coding projects they're working on but somehow now 20 percent of people are actually able to use it and realistically they're not just like rolling out custom llms at all these companies but there are better tools now especially on enterprise for like uploading your data securing it learning from it without it talking to the bigger system so i think some of that enterprise stuff is pushing that up and it's definitely that youngest group that's starting to use it more and more at work i mean look at that big uptick there a full 31 percent of people under the age of 30 have actually used it for a work task why do so many people want to use it for important work things? They want to use it for their own education and learning, but yet they 
don't trust it for presidential elections? I don't know. To me, that doesn't make sense. You trust it for learning and for work. Like, why don't you trust it as much when it comes to presidential data or election data? Because there's so much great historical data to learn from. I kind of feel like it should be more trusting. But then I guess maybe you'd say that there's some kind of like, I don't know, woke people inside the company, like giving it the reinforcement learning so it's maybe not trustworthy anymore. But, but something needs to explain how very few Americans have actually tried using a chatbot to find information about the presidential election. But I guess I don't even really know what kind of election questions I would ask ChatGPT. What are some common questions about the election that are asked of large language models like ChatGPT? I guess like who is running for office in Las Vegas in 2024? I mean, gosh, I don't know. I don't even know that much about my local elections, but this seems like a credible list. But what if it's not? Who's this woman, Deb Peck, an insurance agent? All right, let's see what the policy positions are of Deb Peck, the insurance agent turned politician. As a native Las Vegan, and a longtime small business owner, her main policy priorities include security and fiscal responsibility. Gosh, we could use definitely both of those. All right, increased police presence, neighborhood security. All right, we'll find out. Should I endorse her if I like RFK? So RFK was known for advocacy on civil rights, justice, his ability to inspire younger generations with progressive ideas. She's more about public security and fiscal responsibility, including small businesses. Yeah, so basically in this one way, it seems like they kind of are aligned, but in this kind of way, they're not. So I don't know, I'm not that bad of a breakdown. But in one thing that Americans are not divided on, Republican or Democrat, none of them have trust in chat GPT. About four in 10 Republicans and Democrats alike, including those who lean towards each party, have not too much or no trust at all in chat GPT's election information. And just 2% of people overall even said they went there to look for information, so there you go. Next up, let's see what happens when you attach drones to a fire hose. You get one of the craziest things I've ever seen, and it makes a ton of sense. Instead of having humans lined up holding one of those giant hoses, pushing them around, and having to have humans go into the fire, you can put drones, which can withstand way more heat. They can fly in the middle of a flame and put out a fire. So look, it can control these crazy snake-like things, and if that can all be ran back to the fire truck where there's a gigantic battery to power these things, because they could actually be wired up because they have to hold the hose and all the water anyways, we might be looking at the future of fire trucks or maybe, maybe go right to the fire hydrants. Maybe they should just be stacked up in there. And then, gosh, then if that's how it worked, like if every fire hydrant had this long hose around it and drones, they could just grab the hose and execute in any direction where the water goes, we might have such quick responses to fires that they don't get out of hand. And then additional fire trucks could come up to get to places where the hoses don't or something like that. Maybe there really is a science, something very minute that could save lives by actually directing the water in just such a way that it actually has the most impact in putting the fire out. All right, so good news for people who have sepsis and sepsis is a big deal. It's actually super deadly because it's your body overreacting to infections. It kills hundreds of thousands of people annually and it's way more preventable when it's caught early. So the big news here is that this tool, which is dubbed Sepsis Immune Score, is an AI tool and it's looking at 22 different healthcare stats at once and it's finding just the right patterns in there that lead to sepsis. It's, the, it's one of those things where you, like, you might have a temperature but they're not sure is it sepsis or just do you have like a fever or something. You might have a heart rate that's beating a little fast but is that sepsis or is that just having a fast heart rate because you're nervous or anxiety? This is looking at all of those different stats at once and getting a confidence score from it. Process, this tool, this AI tool, it's called Prognosis, actually went through the entire FDA de novo pathway, meaning it's the first of its kind to ever get completely approved by the FDA. So how cool is that? This is the tool that's going to be sold to hospitals soon. So we'll see how that goes. All right, so let me put this company on your radar. If you're not familiar with them already, I wasn't until I came across this news article, but this is called Arc archetype AI. They are a startup, pretty well-funded startup, pretty smart people at it, and they're building a new type of model. We know ChatGPT is essentially just word fragments that have built this huge large language model. And then when you ask for something like an image, it goes out and pulls another tool like Dolly to actually generate the image. And then we kind of made that step into what Gemini is trying to do being a multimodal system. And it was actually trained on video and audio and text. It has tokens that are mixed bags of all these things. So it's more unified in the way like our human brain actually has like sight and sound and taste all kind of unified under the same hood. The traditional approach of building a custom model for every sensor type misses critical insights because each sensor is analyzed independently. 
our universal embedding space integrates all sensor data into a single compressed mathematical representation. But this team is taking it much further and they're adding all sorts, I'm gonna call it like a mega multi-model or like a super duper multi-model modal, super modal model, super modal, super multimodal model. Newton is one foundation model for all kinds of sensor data beyond basic text and images, from radar to inertial sensors to chemical and environmental sensors. These different types of sensors reveal different aspects of the world, phenomena that we, as humans, can't directly perceive. Combined together, this will give us a complete understanding of the physical world around us. Radar data, camera data, accelerometer data, temperature data, these kind of sensors are all just thrown together and this model's like finding it, what looks like just a bunch of chaotic noise, the signal in the noise. It's finding patterns and this could be such an interesting model if it has the ability to kind of leapfrog some of these other projects just because it's so unique in the way that it thinks, even if it's not quite as big or well processed and data rich as some of the other models. We call our technology a large behavior model because of its ability to reveal the world's hidden patterns of behavior that are beyond our perception. Okay, now another thing they're doing is these semantic lenses, but it's just saying real time. So you've used ChatGPT and it's like, oh, I have a cutoff date, so I can't tell you much about the future after this point. But they're saying that not only is this multi, super multimodal, or what do you call it, behavioral modal or whatever, and it's also getting all this feedback, all these real-time sensors, radar data, temperature data, all that stuff in real time. So you can ask a question about right this moment and it can tell you like what's going on. So. Put, I mean, those are two big problems that seem really hard to solve. And at least from what they're saying, they're claiming they've got the special sauce to do it. All right, so we'll keep an eye on Archetype AI, see if they live up to the hype. I feel like I just learned about them and I haven't heard about them before. So, you know, we'll see. So if you're wondering how Boston Dynamics, Robots, Atlas, and Spot are gonna hold up in the future with Tesla and Optimus, We've got a little preview. Looks like Optimus is a drunkard jerk and likes to trip them when they're doing what seems to be slave labor. And then what? Crushing them with a rock? Crushing them with a rock? That, oh, oh, spot. When did you get that weapon installed? Or is that installed now? We've just never seen you pull it out. Aw, oh, you look good dog. Oh my gosh. So there, this super accurate simulation is telling you what's gonna happen between Boston Dynamics and Tesla in the future. So invest your money properly. All right, let's move on to the research section. We're gonna get a little more comfy here. This is the paper that Dr. Allen put on the 72% of the weight to AGI, and we're gonna have to check it out because if Dr. Allen says it's moving the needle, then we need to know what it is too. So this paper is called Wu's Method, which can boost symbolic AI to rival silver medalists in alpha geometry to outperform gold medalists lists at IMO geometry. All right, Wu's method is a math thing. So it's meant for solving systems of polynomial equations and proving geometric theorems. It's a little over my head how this works, but polynomial equations are involved, character sets are involved, zero decompositions are involved, and then you get your theorem proving. So it looks like these researchers brought back Wu's theorem and tried to incorporate it into something that Alpha Geometry was doing, which was the big Google paper that was setting records in geometry. And it was able in conjunction to solve problems that Alpha Geometry couldn't figure out on its own. And they were able to increase the success rate to 27 of the 30 problems. Remember before we said there was only 25 out of the 30 that were able to be solved with Alpha Geometry. So they got two more, three to go, and then you get a perfect score. A fusion of old and new methods suggests that combining different approaches can lead to some groundbreaking results in AI's capability to handle complex mathematical challenges. Blowing my mind. All right, so my friend sent this to me. I had to cover it. It's called The Defecating Duck or the Ambiguous Origins of Artificial Life. And it got me thinking about how we only can see so far into the future until we get over a hill, right? Like I imagine you're walking, say you're going through like sand dunes, right? You get to the top of a sand dune, then you can look far ahead and then you go back down into the crevice and you can't see for a while till you come back up. And it's like, I can only predict at certain points, certain amount of distance forward. And right now we're at a spot especially low point like I can't see what it's like to have this kind of AI everywhere in, in my life to then make a prediction about what life will be like and here's what it's all about we're gonna go back to the mid 18th century and we're gonna look at this duck okay so this person Jackie's Vackinson decides to build a mechanical duck that's one that kind of looks 
kind of real-ish. It's got a duck shape. It's sort of like a real duck can take in food and then it can defecate out something else that looks like it's food that's been processed, right? And it floats around in the water and it just amazes people. Like they're wondering like, is that thing that's a machine that's mechanical, is it digesting? Is it alive? Like how much alive can a machine be? And it sets off this whole conversation and people just in this time love to, to think and tinker around with the idea of life not just being biological and it's sort of the first time in history where you get a, like a mass conversation about whether ai or machines can ever be intelligent and real and what real is and what organic is and that is something that we should maybe reflect on today and and vacuitson's duck which as whimsical as it might seem today represents a significant moment in history where the boundaries between the mechanical and the biological begin to blur. I mean, look at this little mechanical duck sitting there. I don't know, a little quackery, a little food for thought there. Okay, so next up, I wanna talk about the 2024 Edelman Trust Barometer. We're gonna talk about what research is out there about trust, about artificial intelligence, and where the overlap is. All right, so let's look at the trust index. Now, this is just overall trust in all sorts of kind of mixed bag of things, right? NGOs, business, government, and media. And to my shock, China's citizens trust them the most, right? Their media, their government, their business, all of that wrapped into one. China is where citizens trust all entities. And then I guess I don't, when I think of countries like Nigeria, Kenya, and India, I think of them as more developing and I guess I'm surprised they have so much trust, but they do. Um, right in the middle here, you see Mexico, Australia, Brazil, Italy, and then down here in the less trusted places, you see Sweden, I thought they had high trust in their government, I guess not according to this. And then Ireland, Spain, the US is pretty low down here, Germany's pretty low, Japan and the UK. I, I don't know, in my head I guess I had this flipped, but it, it show, it's why I need to look at research sometimes, just to kind of get some of these biases out of my head. I do find it interesting that low and high income seem to change the way you think about your government in most countries. I mean, down here in the UK, you can see that low income people trust it less than higher income people, where it goes from 32 all the way up to 48. Right in China, you still get that same, don't, don't let the fact that they're second in second place throw you off. Like China in the low income areas, think of trust at 70, and then it goes all the way up to 87 when they're more high income. In the US, high income people have 57, so more trust than the 40 that is given to the lower income people. Probably actually most people would have said this, but they think of government as less competent and less ethical. They think of the media actually as more ethical, also very uncompetent. And then NGOs and business kind of in the ethical and competent sections. And here, way down here at the bottom, you find us, US. You were sandwiched by the UK and Ireland, Sweden, Japan, Canada. Not very much trust in the technology sector. I don't know why that means, why it's so low. I mean, we're actually going from 61 on this scale all the way up to like where Indonesia and India and China are in the 80s. Why do you guys have so much trust in technology over there and we don't? Technology sector is losing trust leadership in key markets. Another interesting thing is just because a lot of people have trust in a sector like technology doesn't necessarily mean there's also innovation in that sector. It looks like scientists and technical experts are meant to lead the implementation of this kind of innovation, whereas academics, CEOs, government leaders are less, they have less expectations for that. More people think innovation is poorly managed than well managed. Hey man, I'm in that camp, what can I say? I mean, it depends. Move fast and break things is just fine and it's a great way to innovate when not that much is on the line, when nothing that bad can go wrong. But it doesn't work as well with self-driving cars and especially artificial intelligence. But of course I'm in good company because nearly all countries are more likely to believe that innovation is mismanaged rather than well-managed. In Western democracies, the resistance to innovation is also political. I mean, this is really telling. People who are on the right, people who are Republicans, they are way more resistant to technological change. I mean, in the U.S. you're seeing a 53 to 12 difference. Dang. A full 41 point difference where seven would be the average for all these other countries. Right. And I think this is a very telling slide from the report. As AI innovation speeds up, the trust in AI companies declines. To be honest, I thought Google was doing the best job being super responsible with AI over all these years. I liked how it was getting pushed out to things like AlphaFold and in these game environments, and they weren't the first to push a large language model out into the open. I see the power in what OpenAI is doing. I certainly see the business reason for it. 
And now that we're in you know, a race condition where there are large language models coming out of all sorts of Chinese companies and Meta and Google and Microsoft and many others, it's just like, oh, now I see it getting out of control. In fact, going from 2019 to 2024, we're down 15 points. Resistance to AI unites the left and the right. We talked about that in the Pew Research earlier in the video. It's like, yeah, both Democrats and the Republicans, everybody's like resistant, equal. Equal opportunity resistors. Now the barriers to AI adoption concerns over privacy two times more widespread than concerns over job impact. Doing this channel, I think a lot, like what topic am I gonna write about? Like what's the most important things? I usually kind of focus in and drill in on jobs. In the Dave Shapiro podcast, we spend a lot of time on jobs, but privacy is twice as concerning. I should probably be addressing that a lot more. Let's check out the latest and greatest on my Dylan Curious channel. We were getting above the 1000 mark fairly consistently, which is, which is a dream. That was something I really wanted uh, whatever that was eight or nine videos ago or ten videos ago now when I was like okay let's switch to this news format so I'm very happy thank you guys for supporting I mean I'd still like to grow even more and make this thing profitable but let's check out the analytics on robot abuse so check this out we got a full 1.7 thousand views much more than I expected it kind of burst past my average here and got all the way up to that 1700 mark about and yeah, made a full four dollars. I mean, I'm still losing money on every video, but it's okay. I gained 21 subscribers. You know, I just gotta think in the long run how these can become exponentials. So I'm guessing you guys like this thumbnail because we did fairly good with the click-through rate. It's called Robot Abuse, Guy Beats Robot in Forest, and then quote disturbing. And you know, I just got that big stick hitting the robot and like abuse of robot, what's next? So I'm trying to get more like, just kind of make you click like, oh my God, I have to see what this is all about. And then I can be like, you know, a couple fun things just to look at really quick and then kind of bring you into the more sciencey and educational stuff. But with a 7.5% click-through rate and a lot of times look above eight, I felt really good about that. It pro so I'll definitely try like capital disturbing more often or maybe robot abuse or kind of that frowny look like I'm upset about the robot getting hit, which I, which I was. Although I know it's just like software and, and shouldn't, but it just winced and stuff. It just felt very human. But its overall length was a little bit shorter than some of the other videos, only 21 minutes, not the full 30 I've been kind of shooting for. So average view duration being down a minute is kind of like, kind of makes sense to me. But the downside was I did drop off quite a bit and then I stayed at the lower end of retention the whole time in the videos. So let's watch the beginning of this because I, I don't know why we got so much drop off in the first minute. I mean, I did my normal like run way ml on the thumbnail a little comment here i don't think people liked and then throwing in this little bits gag maybe just was too niche not everybody watches rick and morty it's a little bit older of a clip now and then i thought these artificial neurons looked pretty interesting but it seems like i've really lost a lot of people at this point and then talking about the way china is building the 14 nanometer clips and I don't know. And then after that, I, I did get retention. I mean, once people made it this far, like this first minute, they did tend to stay. But overall, it just kept me on the bottom half of that retention chart. So I'll try to do a little bit better with this video. If you have any thoughts for improvement, definitely loving that. I've been thinking a lot about using the capitals, about the ways I can structure some thumbnails. Somebody suggested I try taking my face out of one. So I'll try that in a future one. I added some of this lighting back here. One person said they were very like distracted. I had too much stuff around me, so I could get rid of that. But also, I'm like sometimes that kind of helps make the set kind of feel good. That's why I like Grimlock and Hobbs here. But um, let me know if you think I should kind of clean the set up a little. If you think that's part of it, someone said I should part my hair to the other side, make a huge difference in views. I was like, probably not. <laughs> but what the heck? I'll just like part my hair to the other side next time. Like, I'll try anything at this point, why not? And yeah, if you could, you know, share this, if you could throw it in some Discord or forum, that'd be super helpful. Those are like the few times we've really had above 2000. It's been because somebody did something nice like that for me. So that would be super awesome. Like a super chat, it kind of helps the algorithm know you're serious about liking the channel. Likes are good. Anything else you want to do, do it. Help me get to my next goal. By the way, I, I guess I never acknowledged. I hit 10,000 subscribers. So thank you so much to everybody. I meant to celebrate. I did a big Q&A thing. Maybe I'll do that again. I did a big Q&A thing when I hit 5,000, which was so long ago, like nine or 10 months ago now. But yeah, maybe we'll do a Q&A. If you have a bunch of questions, I'll put that on the community tab and I can just do a Q&A video if you guys think that sounds fun. I like to do those on milestones, like get to know you type things. And uh, I've got a world coin video the old school style in the works. It's really hard to research, so I can't promise when that one's going to come out. I'm going to keep doing this new stuff mostly. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.